Hey, I'm Mike Myers, and this is the Songwriting for Guitar podcast, which is geared to support songwriters and producers to gain confidence and turn pro. I bring on industry experts to help you improve and monetize your skills, engage better in the writing process, and build healthy habits to create a sustainable career that you love. Caffeinated, inspirational, conversational. Hey friends, Mike Myers here with the Songwriting for Guitar podcast, episode number 91, Unblocking Creative Potential, the five books you can't miss. Did you know that we're coming up on our 100th episode and we're doing a really big thing? We are trying to get to 100 reviews on Apple Podcasts. We are midway there to our goal, but we need your help, friends. So here's what you need to do. Just if you're listening on Apple Podcasts right now, scroll all the way down. You're going to see reviews. And then if you click see more, you're going to have an option to write a review and just talk about your favorite episode, especially if you've been with us since the very beginning. Give us a five-star review and then just screen capture it and send it to us at support at songwritingforguitar.com because we're giving away lots of stuff, Sweetwater gift cards, GHS strings, some coaching sessions, some courses, but you have to leave a review. So right now, just take a few moments, just scroll down and leave us a review. Believe me, it will help us out a ton because you know those things, they actually matter. I didn't think reviews really did, but guess what? They help bring notoriety, the algorithms and everything, the way it flows. They start to recognize the podcast and recommend it to more people. And that's our goal, to bring all this awareness, all these amazing episodes that we've created and all the amazing episodes we've yet to create to more people. And you can help us. So again, just leave your five-star review, screen capture it, and then send it to us at support at songwritingforguitar.com so you can be entered in the giveaway. These are the five books I'm always talking about with coaching clients, uh, people that are in my inner circle, people that are in my mastermind, people that I connect with at conferences. We're always talking about what are the ones that influence you a ton? And these five influence my view of building a business, creative life, uh, actually having healthy habits and actually maintaining some sense of of consistency in your life, no matter what facet it is, the songwriting aspect, the business aspect, the friendship family aspect, these five books shape how I view that. And I get into it with Heather Taylor in this episode. And what I love is some of these books I've recommended to her, and we're gonna get into one that she has recently recommended to me that was a game changer. So. Here we go, episode number 91, Unlocking Creative Potential, the five books you can't miss. Books, 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 books. Yes. That's what it's all about in this episode is about books. Book nerds, book nerd alert. You know what? I never thought I would be a book nerd. Because I never was a book And nerd. now I call you that all the time. It is. That's the name. That's that. That's what you, in all emails, boxes, everything that you send, company direct, <laughs> even memos to everyone else. Hey, listen, book nerd wants you on. <laughs> you know, it's funny because I was like, well, why am I now like really into books? Uh, and, and especially like telling people about them and like also being a huge advocate for certain ones. And it's crazy because like, I think it was because growing up, I was put in, you know, when you're in Catholic school, this numbers of who you have in your class are not large, but they segmented us into two groups. And it was basically slow kids and kids that could go, that they thought were better. I was in the slow group. And so I was, and they, I know you can laugh. It was funny, but it was, and I was like, well, why is it? And I was like, oh, because the books they were giving us, I could care less about. Mm -hmm. Like I did not care about, and nor do I even remember what we read. Isn't that the case though with a lot of kids that aren't really good normally in school is that they're actually just kind of bored. You know what? I remember one was about a sperm whale. It was like of the history of whales and I could not give a shit. And I remember reading this <laughs> and I'm like, this does not matter. This and you know, and I think my parents got told like, oh, you know, he has you know reading comprehension problems. I think that was a thing, and 
now I'm like, oh, it was because there was no, I saw no value in what I was given. I was like, this does not matter and is just taking space up in my brain right now. The sperm whale did not play guitar. It did not run a business. It did not drink coffee. It did not. So I could care less (laughs) about the sperm. That's great. Great job. (laughs) But it's like, how many people have a terrible or a, a view of reading that was given to them by others that were in a place of a teacher saying, you're not good at reading, you can't do it well, and they've, they haven't read books because they've been given this idea. But the problem is, they just need to be reading the right books that pertain to the thing they want to do. And so this episode, we're going to talk about five books that I think have been transformational in songwriting, in the way that we you know, I run a company the way that I, you know, that these are transformational that I tell others within the company, you have to read like, this is huge. If I have a coaching client, I'm like, we got to read this. The mastermind that I run, I talk about these being like that. We have even like days throughout the mastermind talking, you know, the title is the book because it's that important. Those are the kind of books people should be reading. Those are books that move the needle to where you want to go. And if people just entertain that and start looking for the books that pertain to the things they want to do and the things that are going to help them, they're probably great readers. And also, too, there's so many different ways to consume books than there were, you know, when I was in school. Like, there's audiobooks now. People are like, well, I'm not a reader. Cool. Don't worry about it. There's an audiobook. <laughs> um, and, it's such a good point. And there's, and there's another thing that we use called Blinkist, which is like, cool, you don't have time for all the books? Don't worry about it. Here's a thing that gives you a synopsis and the, the important talking points of the book that you could listen to maybe three times on a drive to work, and you've read the book essentially three times, and you've now maybe absorbed it better than someone else that read it once. I find that with myself as if the, it's the repetition mm-hmm. because I hear what I want to hear the first time. And then the second time, you know, then you're like, oh, I, I get that in a deeper way now. I think these are books too that I've reread or gone back to again. Like, you know, our favorite show, our favorite movie, we have no hesitation to rewatch. I think books that make a huge impact, we need to go back and reread and reread again because we've implemented some of the things the book talks about. And so we see it in a different light. Certain phrases are going to stand out more. I highlight and I underline things in books. So it's interesting to go back and reread and be like, oh, it's interesting that like I highlighted that line. Oh, it's probably because I was thinking of this, but now that I'm here, I'm now interested in this. We see it, uh, completely new things in a completely different light because we've transformed a little bit. Yeah. That's such a good point that, it, that it does change you. It, a book will change you. It changes your mind. It changes your perspective. And then you're going, then you're reading it as a new person from that new perspective. I think that that thing is so important. So we're going to, we're going to dive into five books and we'll include the links in the description so that you can go ahead. And I encourage you to get, I wouldn't, set aside time in a podcast to talk about books if I didn't think this was a huge, huge thing. So the first one, Who Not How. Who Not How, Dan Sullivan, uh, Dr. Benjamin Harding. Is that it? I always want to say them. Is that the other author? author? Because this is what's interesting. The concept of the book, too, is based off of, you know, oh, cool. I, you know, I'm a coach. I teach these principles. I want to write a book, but you know what? I don't have time to write a book. So you know what? I'm going to connect with someone who's going to write the book for me. It's the initial concept of the who, not how. So much of our lives are spent trying to master literally everything. And you can't. You can't master every facet that you want to do. Although you want to. And and it's not to say that we can't get better at it but we are familiar yeah we just can't it never gets to that everything can't get refined not it it just can't so it's like what is your thing and then when you spot something it's like i you know so in a songwriter context we have people that listen to this that are probably developing their guitar skills it's getting great but you know what uh their production skills not good right now. And they're spending so much time concerning themselves with like, I got to get the mix right. I got to do, wouldn't it be better to connect with someone that's already mastered that? And that is their 
you know, whether it be their zone of genius, that thing that they're really good at, and you just connect with them and you give them the recording and then they then use their expertise to enhance it. It's going to be way better as opposed to you spending the hours upon hours trying to be like, okay, so I've added this EQ because I was told to, and I have no idea what this does. And I've busted four times to five different things that I have no idea what these do. Uh, But, you know, here we go. I bet it's good. No, it's not. (laughs) That's the whole point of it. That's the whole point of the who, not how. And to me, in the context of business, there was a point when I was reading this that I was like, oh, you know what? I probably need to get some sort of virtual assistant or someone on my team because right now it's just me and I'm doing a whole lot, but it feels like I'm doing a whole lot of nothing. (laughs) Like the needle's not moving forward or I've reached the amount as much as we can grow based on me trying to do everything. And that I foresee that I might get burnt out. (laughs) I foresee that I might. And that's where Heather came in at a time where I was thinking this and it was like the universe kind of worked and knocked on the door and you were like, hi, I was wondering, do you need a virtual assistant? I was like, hmm, (laughs) interesting. You're like, yesterday I was thinking I need a virtual assistant. I'm like, okay. And it was. And to me, it was one of those moments of what happened. This is where you have to see like, oh, I'm bringing someone that's going to help me scale and grow this thing. You know, if you're a songwriter, bringing on someone that has better production skills and mixing skills onto your team means you're going to get well-crafted, radio-ready songs. You're going to have a better polished demo that you feel proud showing someone confidently as opposed to starting with, well, I kind of did this myself, so bear with me. It might be okay. I'm kind of new to making excuses. So I think that- What do you want? Yeah. What do you want? Do you, do you want to be like, is it more important for you to be like, I did everything. I cooked everything on this plate (laughs) or, and, and be like, and serve a guest something that they're like not wanting to Mm -hmm. eat really, but they're just being nice. Like, Ooh, or do you want to be like, Hey, I just like hired a five star chef. You want to come over to eat? Yes, I do. Of course I do. I'm your biggest fan now. (laughs) I think that right there is, you, they do talk about that in the book at length about the ego, the idea of like, we love the fact saying like, oh, but so-and-so does all of this, but so-and-so does, but they do, but they, they've got a team. Every, every brand, every, every good songwriter has a team. There is yep, a team. Surprise. Yes. There's always small, little, tiny exceptions. But if we want to see success, if we want to see that needle move further to the direction we want to do where we want to go you have to have a team and so that means relinquishing control a little bit letting go of the ego and allowing people that are good in that area to help you that will essentially bring you further along and quicker to where you want to go as opposed to you slowly moving slowly being like but i did every thing my (laughs) self i think we just like that saying and so absolutely that book to me is huge for a couple of things taming the ego but also making reframing when you feel like oh i don't know how to do that instead going like well who knows how to do that for me who could help me with instead of i guess i can't do it Mm -hmm. that's the alternative i think that right there is probably it's still one of the biggest things. And I, that's why the mastermind has a week where we just go with the who, not how idea. And every time I talk about this, they're like, Oh, okay, there we go. And suddenly you no longer see lack, but you see opportunity. And I think that's a huge, that's a huge game changer for me in anything songwriting wise, anything monetization wise, anything business wise, anything that you're doing. It's a, you know, that's how I viewed when I got the studio. I was like, I tried to hang up a sound panel for a second and I already could see like, I'm going to damage this wall. I just got out my phone and I was just like, handyman, Tennessee Frank. And that's how I found Jim. <laughs> Good Lord. And you, fa- and you went and found Jim. And the, the thing is like, I, I did contact you, but even if I didn't contact you, you would have went out and found somebody. Yeah. 
you wouldn't have waited for the universe to 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 bring you somebody once you understand what you need yeah. you you immediately go and try to find it mm-hmm. you're more open to the opportunity too and you kind of see that uh but it worked out where uh, you know part of my me was at first was like i may hire some virtual assistants that may not work out hmm? You got to, you know, but you're going to find the one that does work out. And luckily it was the first hire. And it was like, yay, it worked. Happy dance. Um, so that's why I think the who not how mentality is huge because it plays it. in every facet now of how I view things. Okay. So the next book, if we are going to go, let's entertain that I made a decision uh, that when I chose to get that virtual assistant, I allowed the universe to help and Heather entered to me. Let's talk about big magic. That's the other one on my, you know, on my board, Elizabeth Gilbert, who I totally wrote off for years. I have to admit, I worked at borders and she came out with eat, pray, love. And I was like, ugh. so many people were like, I want to buy eat, pray, love. And I was like, that's a dumb book. And then the movie comes out. People like eat, pray, love. And I'm just like, Yep. You were like one of those musicians that hate pop music just because it's pop. <laughs> but it's but instead it was just a popular book. And stuff. I think I was. I was so sick of working and people being like, Oh my god, eat pray love. This is and I was like, that's such a dumb name for a book. I was like, whatever. <laughs> but then I became really big into Rob Bell and I loved him. And he was like, Oh, I'm doing these events with my friend Elizabeth Gilbert. And I was like, eh, I know who she is. And I was like, I may like entertain an episode that they recorded and I'll listen to it. Cause I like Rob and I was like, Oh, she has some good points. And then I saw her Ted talk and I was like, Oh, okay. I don't mind it. And then I was like, there's some depth. There. And then I heard this book mentioned again and again, big magic, big magic. And I was like, okay, I will take. And then that's when I started dating Jen. She was like, Oh, big magic is great. And I was like, okay universe i'll go listen to it and so it was a drive to tennessee got the audiobook and so it's like an eight hour drive and i just listened to it the whole way and i was like holy shit this book is fabulous and then i listened to it again while i was in tennessee driving around to different rights and doing everything and then i listened to it on the way back because i was just like this book is phenomenal and so essentially, it, it just transformed the way I viewed creativity, how I viewed opportunity. I was very much a trying to make opportunity happen, like get the crowbar, throw it, wedge it in between the doors, try to wedge it open, be like, I'm here, and trying to open it. But the idea of you don't have to force to make it happen, that creativity is always at your disposal that you don't have to force good songs to happen, happen, work at your craft. They'll happen. Uh, my favorite story is, and I'll only say is the lobster story at the tail end of the book, showing up at the party in a lobster costume. And if you're like, Mike, what the hell yet? Then go listen to the book uh, and find this out. Is this is the hook of what I mean. <laughs> I found myself many a times in scenarios where I'm like, I'm in the lobster. I'm in the lobster costume right now. And that's okay. I'm just going to own it right now. It's wonderful. But I had so many obstacles to get to reading that book that I'm like, I wish I would have read that sooner. Interesting. Okay. So if you did read it sooner, what do you think? How do you think your life would have changed? I think I would have been a little less harsh on my self creativity, uh, on uh, especially writing. There are times that I wrote and you know we all have those moments where we're writing and it feels forced and it feels great because we're just like Ugh. or sometimes we get in that headspace of doubt like these are as many this is as much as i have in me in songwriting wise and so i have to make these songs work as much as possible because there's no way i have more in me but her view of creativity that it's this endless well that it is it is you can tap into it any time and that voice that you're hearing of fear, of that anxiety, of that stress convincing you that you are lacking, it's because you're allowing it at the helm where it's there, but it's merely to be a backseat passenger. It is not driving. You are the one in control. And so when you have those moments, or I had those moments of feeling that lack, feeling that envy, feeling those those feelings, which we all do, of just like, 
oh, I'm going to miss the opportunity. It's because you're allowing that fear to take the wheel and the helm. And you can just take the helm and just tell fear, like, you are you can sit back there. You can be quiet. I acknowledge that you are a companion on this, but you're not driving, so just hush. Like, so if they're like, mm-hmm. are we there yet? Shut up. You're, I will let you know when we're there. <laughs> you can just be quiet. This is long. You're fine. You, you know, just <laughs> allowing it to, to view your fear not as domineering and like, you know, looming, but instead just like a whiny, tiny little kid on the back, like, you know, see it being like, yeah, huh? Here, you just play with your Nintendo Switch and I'll let you know when we're there. Okay. <laughs> That's how I view <laughs> fear now is not really big and looming, but just like a very insecure child. Well, even that recognition, right, is like mm-hmm. just even separating yourself just from like, oh, like fear is separate from me or these these emotions are separate from me and like I am driving, I'm taking the helm, yeah. like even just that and the way that she puts it and then the way that she, yeah, just the way that she conveys all these concepts, it's just very easy to read and it's it's a real page turner. It really, it enlivens you in a way that you just want to keep on reading it. And once I, you know, when I came back from the trip in Nashville, because I think that was a solo trip, I was like, Jen, oh my God, big magic, you were right. And then I got the, uh, the physical copy and then I read it because I enjoy kind of doing the joint audiobook and physical copy. Cause I feel like I'm consuming it in different ways that I'm like, I'm absorbing it a little bit more. Like I'll listen to audiobooks of books that I've read a bunch of times, but it's interesting sometimes hearing from the author or getting the unabridged version where they kind of go like, Oh, let me tell you why I wrote this. And I'm like, Oh yes. Tell me why you wrote, <laughs> tell me why you wrote this. But yeah, I always that number two, uh, not it's not in pray love, but big magic. Haven't read big pray magic. love yet. <laughs> still not, still not there. I saw the movie. I didn't feel the need to read it. So that's that one is not on the list. You know, that is not on the list. That's another episode. <laughs> we'll have a we'll have an episode full of books not to read. We'll like, like, all, all the authors, <laughs> but the ones that we don't like from them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We'll just be like, don't read that one. Um, okay, so this one. I feel like, you know, you've given, you know, we'll get to the book that you gave me, but the the book that I feel like, or the author that I gave you that we can geek out and be like, fan crush over. Ooh, I know what you're going to say. I know, you know what I'm going to say. It's like (laughs) high performance habits, Brendan Bouchard. Brendan Bouchard, he has changed my life. He is so good. He is so good. Um, And I've seen him speak twice. And I'm just like... Each time I get ready, I'm just like, I, you know, the first time he was the first speaker of the morning, I got there early. I was like, I'm here. I'm in my seat. I'm like, I am ready. Okay. I have my notebook out. I've got my camera. I am ready. Here we go. And then when I saw him literally, uh, maybe like almost a year later, I still had the same reaction of just like, okay, I'm here. I'm in my seat. I'm ready. Oh my God. And then my friend Michael was in an elevator with him after. And I was just like, because he had texted both my friend Jody and I, and he was like, I was in the elevator with Brendan Bouchard. And I was like, (gasps) You didn't tell me that. He, yeah, he did. He was, so this was, he was in the, it was just him. He was like, I got in the elevator. And then the elevator opened and he got in. Did they talk or did he? Yeah. Just- and he was just like, Hey, I just wanted to say, I, you know, I'm a huge fan. I loved what you do. I love Gro- growth day and the whole thing. And he said in the kindest voice, Brendan was like, Oh my God, you do love it. Like it's making an impact. Like was genuinely like, that's so good to hear. That is what I, and it was just like, he was like, he is exactly like the person that you hear, that you see that is, truly caring about the impact that he's making. And if you don't know Brendan Bouchard, he is basically a leader in high performance habits. He has made his mission to understand people that perform at the highest level, that take care of themselves, that are making impacts, that are innovators, that are game changers, that are coaches, that perform at a level that we think is like, that's impossible. He breaks it down into, here are the characteristics of what make them up. Here are the habits that they perform 
that make it consistent. Here are the things that they're doing so that you can understand. But yeah, I, if you didn't, I can't believe I didn't tell you that Michael met him in the elevator. I can't believe you and didn't tell me that either. He was, I was just so excited. I was just like, shut up. And he, it just, he was like, he's exactly how he is in the books. And he just cares. So and refreshing. he was genuinely just like, oh my God, you, it does matter. Like it's he helped. Felt, he actually felt like he was genuine, which is like, there are so many people who you meet and you're like, might have caught him at a bad time, but it's like, don't meet your your hero- heroes. That's not the case with him. And I'm so glad to hear that. I was, after he told me that, I felt like I was rushing around every point of the hotel because I was like, make the moment happen. I will run into him. Brendan, <laughs> Brendan. <laughs> just, just like it was trying a crowbar, to- crowbar moment again. You needed to read Big Magic in that. <laughs> <laughs> but I just wanted it to be like that moment, like serendipitous. Oh my God, you bumped. <gasps> oh. <laughs> but to me, if you don't know who he is, he is a, basically a leader in high performance habits. Like people that are leaders in their area, people that are at a level that seems like that's not possible. They all have common traits and characteristics that he has made it his mission to understand that. And he has shared his journey in understanding that and a way of communicating that for entrepreneurs, no matter what area that you're in. And if you're a songwriter, you basically are an entrepreneur. You are building yourself a business. You're building that. He is essentially showing you in this book, High Performance Habits, how you can start executing this. And to me, that was a huge game changer because, again, it made me aware of a lot of things that I was doing, that I was wasting my time. I thought they were like moving the needle forward and I was like, oh yeah, but those things long-term didn't matter. And some of it was self-care too. I was not, you know, instituting a, you know, form of like gratitude and practice. I immediately ordered his high performance, (laughs) like, you know, you know, journal. And I was like, and it came and it was this gigantic thing. And it was asking questions about my day, uh, you know, I, he was the first person to really make me think about transitions from have, you know, throughout my day. Okay. Like I'm on this podcast with Heather. When this ends, I'm making a transition. Am I carrying like, you know, let's say something happened, in the, the podcast that I didn't like, am I carrying over that feeling into the next habit, the next thing I'm doing, or am I being like, okay, listen, some things didn't work out in the podcast. We maybe had a technical snafu and I got annoyed, anxious. That was then. That's okay. It happens. But I'm now segueing into this next thing where a lot of us are just acting on that one feel. And so that's why how, you know, when we say, how'd you feel today? Frazzled. Why? Ah! And it's just like, did everything make you feel frazzled? Or was there one particular thing that happened that then caused you to carry that interaction through every interaction that you have where people were like, Oh, okay. Stay. And it, I was not good at that at first transitions, but it just made me, Oh, this is a thing that needs to be ongoing. And that's why every day I need to check in with myself and as app growth day, game changer every day, every day is a great day to grow. Every day know. is a great day to grow. We're going to include that, the link in this to uh, Try Growth Day, because I think, you know, this came out two years ago. I've had it in the beta test. When it came out, I was such a huge fan of him that when he was like, I'm doing this thing, I was like, sold. Mm-hmm. I'm in. Same. What is it? Same. And I was like, hey, Heather, do, the, gro- the Growth Day is the app. Um, you, you should we joined, be, we should be, <laughs> we joined <laughs> without each other knowing. I'm like, yeah, I'm on yep. it. Like- <laughs> on it, on it, because he really has made a huge, like he has helped presidents, CEOs, billionaires, you know, athletes, billion people at very high levels to be, because they need help. He's taking that same information that he's applying to them bringing it down for everyone because if you know to get in his backstory it's a very you know it's a heavy backstory but you'll understand why his mission is this and why this matters 
to create impact, create change. Because if you write songs, you want someone to be impacted by that song. You want them to have that change. You want that song to do something that that means something. You have that. You want to create an impact. For me, I want that with my songs, but also with my company. I want people to feel inspired to better their skills, to get really good, to to push past where they are, to take them to a level where they can, that they go like, I didn't know I was capable of that. But since I've done this, I realize I am. I want the people that work with me to feel like that they have a chance to grow, to build something, do something really good that the work they're doing is at a level of not just like, oh, well, Mike can't, doesn't want to do, you know, doesn't want to do this. <laughs> But because that's that's what you sound like, Heather. Muck does want to do this. Sometimes I do use that voice. I freely admit. And let me double down on something about about Brendan Bruchard. Mm-hmm. I I I think that when people are as excited about somebody as we are, it is actually sometimes right now it's yeah. sometimes a turn off because they're yeah. like Ugh, cult. Ugh, they're like <laughs> peddling something. They're trying to sell something or so, mm-hmm. you know. But yeah. that's. I just want to just make it very clear. It's it's not the case. It's um, <laughs> it's very much not a cult. Um, that's what people in cults say. Um, no, 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 no. But I I think that when people are talking about like high performance habits, people automatically go to burnout. You mm-hmm. just want they just want you to be in hustle culture, work all the time, and not have a life. He is all about the holistic. Mm -hmm. individual growth so he's addressing everything he he's addressing doing the things doing schedules doing all the like annoying things that we thought were annoying and then he makes it fun by incorporating uh, emotional mental physical spiritual like all the things yeah um and and you can't help but feel better once you start doing them it's it really is about the person versus it's like the intention and the person growing versus like all the results. He's not, he likes the results, but do you know what I mean? I I get what you're saying where it's just like, we can't, you know, when I talk about these books and and especially this, it may sound overexcited and you may be like, ugh, it's because they have made a, 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 such a huge change in so many facets of my life that I feel like, we got to do an episode and talk about this. Like, I think this is huge. Um, at the same time, I was very skeptical of people that were considered like thought leaders, motivational, because I was just like, right. I just got that, you know, that cheesy vibe or right. that I think, you know, growing up in the nineties, that after hours infomercial or toxic. Yeah. That kind of toxic, just like, I got to tell you what to do. You got to hustle. You got to grind. And when you feel like you can't get up, you got to push yourself off the ground and move. And it's just like, or not. I just, I was so skeptical of that. But to have someone say, oh yeah, that isn't good. That's not the way it should be. It's like, oh, that's what pulled me into his world was that sort of idea in his podcast. and just his books um, and hearing his story of like, oh, he's come close to death a couple of times. And so he feels very bad. Pa- this isn't like uh, a get rich quick scheme. This isn't, you know, a pyramid scheme. He just truly believes in this message because it's transformational. And it's important. Oh, mm-hmm. that's where, you know, because when you have those moments, your mission becomes a lot more focused your mission becomes a lot more clear because you realize that you have limited time. And so how can I make the most of that? So I think that's why, you know, I paid attention more to him than maybe necessarily other people within that field. Um, Well said. It's it's a good book. It's a good book. Live, love, matter. That's his, that's his thing. Yeah. So it's Mike and Heather jumping in the middle of this episode, talking about books to talk about a book that's coming out because I have the first ever book that is coming out that I've ever written. And it's called The Song Writing Guitarist, Transformation in Just 15 Minutes a Day. Essentially, I wanted to take almost a decade, at this point, a decade and a half of experience 
teaching guitar, teaching it for songwriters, using my knowledge in terms of my journey of songwriting and how I got into rooms and leveraging my guitar skills to write better songs, to connect with others and use that as the asset, use that as essentially my calling card. That's what this book is about and how you can start to transform your playing to unlocking the better songs and not necessarily go scouring for them, but realizing them they're already in your head, but we need to unlock them with a certain process in a certain form. Guitar can be so complicated if you are looking at it from one perspective of just trying to learn it and tackle it. There's too, too much information out there. So Mike is distilling it down into a simple system the three things that you can use in order to practice and to leverage your skills. If you're a, an advanced guitarist, if you're a beginner guitarist, you can go back to these three things and, and be able to call yourself a songwriting guitarist. If you perfect these, you don't have to be a shredder. You don't have to be Eddie Van Halen and, and you don't, you certainly don't have to be the best guitar player in the room in order to be a songwriting guitarist. And that's the whole point of of this book and yeah it certainly changed my perspective on guitar and why i want to play it that's the whole point of this is because i want people to have a positive outlook when it comes to their guitar so many songwriters freak out when they think of oh they love the idea of holding their guitar as they're walking to a right but the idea of opening it up holding the guitar and then playing and being like (gasps) That's where the fear is kind of instilled because we're kind of locked into one view of guitar. So I want you to be able to unlock many different aspects, many different emotions to feel it that you're not limited when it comes to your playing and ability. So right now, pre-orders are up for the book. If you go to songwritingguitaristbook.com, you can go right there and pre-order the book because it's coming out September 26th, which is crazy. It sounds like it's so far away, uh, but it's not. It's just creeping. September's just creeping around the corner. And what's creeping around the corner is my book saying like, hey, did you pre-order me yet? Did you pre-order? Did you pre-order? Psst. Come on over here. So songwritingguitaristbook.com to pre-order the book. And enough of my jibba-jabbing about the book. Back into the episode. All these books that we're recommending, we're going to put links in. But here's another thing. You have this thing called a public library, which is huge. And you can go there and you can request books if they don't have it. I think people forget how simple it is to go to a library and just be like, da, 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 da. you don't have this book. I'm going to request it. And they'll br- ship it in. It's true. And they'll call you and text you and be like, hey, here it is. It's a new technology. And I think that's the thing too. You don't have to buy these books. You can go out and even audiobooks. There's a lot of public libraries that are now making audiobooks available. For free, even. Uh, and I would encourage songwriters. The reason I'm talking about these books is your education needs to expand. It's not just in the songwriting aspect, but a lot of these books are going to help branch you out into other areas to help build better habits for sustainability because i want people who want to write songs to be able to write songs continuously that there's not a period of like well i've got a good two years that they feel that they can keep this going bam that's it okay so we've done three books so here we go the fourth book now this book let's get back to you know what let's do this let's do a recent book so i was like i know i told you about high performance habits But this book is totally credit to Heather. Oh, this is my, this is my Bible right now. I love it (laughs) because it addresses this, the, I, the, the thing that everybody goes through when they're trying to reach goals, it addresses being stuck Mm -hmm. and it's called the anatomy of a breakthrough. It's, I have a prop. It's right here. It's by Adam, (laughs) Adam Atler, anatomy of a breakthrough, beautiful book. So he's a really well-rounded author, uh, I think, and he really speaks to the creative individual in a very relatable way. Like he uses scientific studies, he uses examples in tech, architecture, um, like top 40 or 
500 companies, sports, art, music, movies. Like he uses all these examples. And even though like some are very scientific, which is like mm-hmm. extremely helpful because it's very clear, it's not snooty. It's not snooty in any way. It's not boring. He keeps it moving. He gets it interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's such a great book. He has such a great perspective. And he he talks about just getting out of getting out of stuckness, getting out of trying to reach a goal and then just slowly moving through molasses and then giving up. It's this this one concept. He talks about it at the very beginning of the book and it really is just everybody starts excited, ends excited and in the middle of it there's a drop off like crazy. So it's it's really motivating. It's the messy middle. Yeah. Especially for create creators, you know, that's, we don't have to be doing this. And so it's like, we need extra motivation. And this book is extremely motivating. And it like, it just inertia is the, is the way to describe this book. It will give you momentum. All of these books are helping that specific area, the, the middle, because the the exciting is always I, I feel like that's the romantic part of creativity because it's like, oh, it's the start of something. And it's like, yeah. And then there's the end of things. I've accomplished my goal. It's not interesting. I don't the middle is just like nobody talks about it. Why? Because it's not glamorous. It's not exciting. It's just like eh. it's uncomfortable. It's it's just like it's it's not perfect. It's actually showing where it's like you're struggling trying to grasp it and try to master the thing. You're trying to take it to a new level and it's not working out. It's not happening right away. The timeline that you thought it was going to take is not the timeline that's happening. But what I loved about that book, because when you told me about it, I was like, okay, I'll go into Audible. And I was like, anatomy of a breakthrough. There we go. And I listened and I was like, holy shit. He's taught. It was. It spoke more because I was feeling a little bit, not so much in a funk, but I felt like, okay, so a lot of the things that I'm doing are coming up on that, like, you've been doing them for a bit. You've been doing them for a while, and you're ready to move it to another level. You know it can go to another level, but this is where the consistency, where the focus and the steadfastness needs to come in even more. Like, I mean, the number of, like, how many times Thomas Edison like try 10,000, 10,000 to invent a lot. I'm like, at what point at 8,000, how many friends were like, like, dude, listen, this guy's crazy. You're, you're, you're a smart guy. Uh, You know, uh, this is, maybe you should stop. And I, but it's, it is true. How many people stop when the thing is only starting to develop and they're so quick, but the anatomy of a breakthrough is just like, I think it's, you know, part of it is inspirational because there's so many examples. He really has done the research to show the development process and many stories of where you could have kind of stopped and just been like, and people would have been understanding. I think people that don't really want to push themselves beyond, if you're around that a lot, they'll usually give you many times to hit the eject button because they're like, oh, you don't have to. You don't have to. Oh, don't worry about that. Don't worry about that. It's not worry. Don't do that. Just you could stop. Because mm-hmm. they haven't they haven't pushed back past that. They haven't mm-hmm. they haven't realized how to get past that discomfort level. And they're just like, you know, it's not worth it. Like, because but why would you listen to them? You need to listen to people who have pushed past that and go, they look back and they're like, come on, that was amazing. You know, you can do this too. I've been thinking about like, you know, the things that we talk about, like, oh, there's lots of exciting things that we're going to be doing the rest of this year. Oh, and then next year, I think of the very first, you know, in the online space, we call them webinars. And I think at this point, everyone's been on a webinar. Mm-hmm. First one I ever did, there were three people on it. Two without their cameras on, there one, and one with their chin looking down at me, just being like, whoa. And I was just like, I have to be insane. This is ridiculous. Yet part of me was like, but I'm wondering if I just stay with it a little bit longer, if it could be better. 
Okay, I'm going to stay with it. The podcast. I did an ep- I remember having a bizga. You should start a podcast. I was like, that's terrible. And I <laughs> shouldn't. And that's dumb. And here we are. It's like getting up to 100 episodes. I'm like, huh. I actually stayed. Like, you know, the number of podcasts that start right now. The graveyard of podcasts are amazing. Graveyard mm-hmm. is filled with great podcasts that but never made it past. made it to 30, right? Something the, yeah, like that. Yeah, it's like at the maximum, maybe they made it to 50, but most under 40 episodes, they stop. Or you'll notice a very inconsistent manner in which they started. And then there's like a 12-week break. And then there's a 40-week break. And there's a week break. And so it's just like the consistency can't. And then they go like, well, I guess, you see, not worth it. Can't get started. And it's like, yeah, you didn't give it time. Chris, who produces this episode, he was like, oh, no, no, no. You got to get to you know, you, you have to stay with it because it's the only way you're going to build it. And I was like, oh, it makes sense. Seth Godin will appear on pretty much any podcast, but his one criteria has to be past 100 episodes. Uh-huh. So that's why we'll have Seth, Seth Godin. Godin. I'll just be like, um, Seth, come on down because we're getting... Dear sir. Because he will not, he will, but he wants to see that you put in the time. And so I'm like... Smart. So many things, so many cool at this point. Now that I've gotten, we're getting 200. I'm like, all right, man, think of what'll happen past 200 episodes, 300 episodes. Th- so it's like the idea in that book. I was like, oh, the messy metal, just, just staying with it, just staying consistent with it because man, maybe the things I'm creating, I'm like Edison. I'm just like Thomas Edison at like 8,000 bulbs. They're not bad, but like I got kinks to still work out. I haven't gotten to my 10,000 yet, but once I do, I'll be like, oh, whoa, there we go. That's the thing. So it's staying consistent with it. And the book tells you how to stay consistent mm-hmm. in a lot of different ways. It's going to speak, it probably will, at least it spoke directly to me. It was like, Heather, this is how you do this. And I'm like, oh, thank you, Adam. I hear you. Like it speaks right to you. This book will get very, very popular. This is a relatively new book. Buy it. Buy it yeah. before it. It becomes. It's it not beca- in your library. I have it. Yeah. <laughs> I checked out all the books in the library. Go buy it. They're all gone. <laughs> so go, go, go stream it on Audible too. Um, okay. The last one. And here's the thing. It was hard to pinpoint when I was setting up the studio. I was like, there needs to be a shelf with my go-to books, like the books that have like had a lot of impact on me. And I, st- we still haven't gotten all of them because I'm like, there needs to be like 20, there's going to be too many episodes. So this next one was the same authors of who, not how, and it was the gap in the gain. The gap and in the gain. This one to me, again, <sighs> you know when i'm pausing of what to say you know it's like this is big because i'm like the words that come out of my mouth right now need to be profound to show how important this matters on the initial reading of what the concept is people write this off and i'm like yeah because i heard someone once tell me like oh i kind of get the gist of what it was Right. And I was like, no, you didn't stay with it long enough because you need to start implementing this into your view of things. The gap in the gain says we have two ways of looking at things. And I will, I will kind of do the quick summary, but I encourage you the book dives in deeper examples and explanations in better ways that I can't say. But essentially, we have two ways of framing things. We can go like, well, that was pointless. It didn't work out, which I think the majority of people tend to lean towards. Why we have a lot of critical things, I think, in society. Oh, oh it just didn't work out. You know, ugh, ugh, ugh. Tried you know. it once, didn't get any result. But the, the game goes like, well, that's interesting. I'm fascinated by that. That didn't work out. Well, you know what? It's... Ah, I see. Like, so this wasn't too bad. This is, this has some bright spots, but actually how I set this up. Yeah. That's why it didn't work out. Cool. So I'm, I'm going to do this again, but based on how this worked out, I'm going to tweak this a little bit right here. And I'm going to try this again. Automatically. That is a better frame. Let's say you have a bat in the songwriting sense. Like we didn't get a song in co-writing. It didn't work out. 
one group goes, well, that's because co-writing is it's stupid. It's not, it's, it, you, if you're going to get a good song, it needs to be just from you. You can't have collaboration. The, the gap, the gang goes, Oh, you know what? We didn't talk enough at the beginning of the co-write. We didn't actually like establish what was going to happen. I probably could have explained like, I'm not the strong of a lyricist. And so they were probably like relying on me to write lots of lyrics. I'm more melody and they're more melody. Oh, we kind of mismatched. Okay, cool. Co writing's good, but I just got to be more clear on the f- on the front end before we start writing. If you go with that mindset, and your next co writes are going to get better. There's so many facets of your life that we may, and it made me realize there are points where I wrote off things too soon, or I go like, "Oh, that wasn't worth my." Same. But the the way I viewed it was because I was just looking for the lack, the the emptiness, or I guess like to also maybe give myself an exit to the hard work <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> to be like, Oh yeah, it's, a f- yeah, it's going to be messy, but uh, there's still, there's still some things you got out of it. You're going to have to, you know, the phrase I say, do it again, you know, write the song again, do it again. The gap gives us the, the dopamine hit of what we want. Oh, I don't want to do the hard work. So it's easier to find the excuse of why it didn't. So I'm yeah. Just why did that. why didn't this work? Oh, it's because of that. Oh, I guess this is not what I what I'm gonna do. This is not gonna. I'm gonna look for a new thing that gives me a dopamine hit. I'm gonna look for that new that new thing that makes me excited. And then as soon as that doesn't keep giving me that hit, then I'm gonna move on again. Because we all and love the starts off. of things. We love, love the starts of things. We love, love again. It. This goes to anatomy of the breakthrough in the middle. We love the beginnings of things because that's why we we do this thing. Where we're like, oh, I'm so excited about this, and then suddenly, like two weeks later, this is the worst thing ever. And it's yeah, just we like, get to oh. tell people about it. We get to be. We get to like think all the possibilities and all the hope and everything. I had a friend who would always get different jobs. He would always be excited. Got a new job. This is the one, like almost excited of just like, this was great. This was amazing. This is going to be, this is the game changer for me. I feel it two weeks later. This is the worst thing ever. I need to get out. And it's like, (laughs) and then suddenly again, guys, I got a new job. I'm really excited about this. This is going to be the two weeks. And it was like Joe from Arrested Development. I've made a huge mistake. And it's just like, oh, and it's just like, it's your mind. It's your framing. Wherever you go, you are. (laughs) You can't escape it. But I think the gap in the gain, even though the concept sounds obvious, it's very hard to implement. And that's why it's important to listen to something like this and see examples of why it mattered and why it transformed. And that you listen to it again. I've probably gone through that book a whole bunch of times because it matters. Because these things need to be implemented. These five, to me, create a healthy, well-rounded, creative in both sense, in the sense of song creation, but also building your brand creation. Because if you're a songwriter, you want known, you want to start connecting with people. So essentially, you're building that brand. Building your life. That has to be sustainable in some way. It can't be fleeting or quick or overnight or, you know, autopilot, uh, but it has to be run. So that means good habits have to be instilled. We have to have ways of framing things where they don't work out. We have to be able to process and look for good things that are happening and what needs adjusted. And to me, these five books that we've recommended are just like, they are still, there's a reason these five, I think, came to the forefront when we were like, oh, this episode needs to be about the five books and why these five particular took precedent over other ones that we would love to recommend. Um, but that's a whole other episode. I, I thought about the honorable mentions and I was like, yeah, I was like, ah, oh, the honorable mentions, but I don't want to say no. the honorable mentions and downplay no. them as honorable mentions, but I right. want to give them the attention because they're just as a, I feel these books were early on the catalyst to me discovering other books that were recommended or other books that were within this same field. I think these would change anybody's 
uh, mindset and perspective. If if you went through one by one, I would be really interested to hear if anybody hasn't read these, what what they think after this episode. So if you do read these and you want to put it in the comments in the podcast and then leave a review, that would be amazing. Um, but we love these books. Hope you hope you would love these books too because they have certainly changed a lot in each of our lives. Yeah. It's a, gi- a huge, a huge transformation. So I'm glad, Heather, we could geek out about books on this episode. Yes, book nerds. And that does it for this week's episode. It was edited and produced by Chris Vefalius. I'm Mike Myers. Thanks for listening. <laughs>